Okay, guys, I'd like to continue and record the lecture on our timing analysis using the Vivado tools to perform a timing analysis on the FPGA. Uh, this is for our class and also for Haney Williams and his class. So as the introduction, we have been learning how to design throughout 201, 301, now into 361. And we learn how to use the Xilinx tools, the Vivado development environment, to design and to simulate. So our emphasis up to this point in time has been on verifying the functionality of our design. What we want to go on now is we want to go on to some of the concerns that arise when we want to implement our design. Primarily, it has to do with timing analysis. And the bottom line is, once we program the FPGA, will it be able to meet timing, is what we would say in the industry. Or what we just want to make sure is that every path in the delay, will, in the design, will meet the requirements that are imposed upon it. So we want to verify all the timing requirements are met. <clears throat> that include the setup and hold. We want to make sure that the frequency that we set up to operate our device at will be able to run at properly. And if there's any unconstrained paths, we want to be able to determine if they are going to work properly as well. So where we are at is we continually come back to refer to the detailed flow of performing the digital design. At the top, we have the design entry. This is, of course, where we have some requirements that have been given to us. Most of us up to this point in time, the requirements come from the instructors telling us what they want us to do. Once you've done your design, you then go into a functional simulation. And the goal there is to ask the question, does our design do what it's supposed to do? Now, what's shown, not shown here is that along with the development of the design, there is the necessity to also create a test fixture or test bench to drive the functional simulation. And engineering being an iterative process, it, when you are doing your development, you may continuously create, verify, create, verify, until you convince yourself your design does what it's supposed to do. Now, for the most part now, once we reach that point in time, we just walk all the way through to the mapping, place, and routing, and then we just program our chip. What we want to do is to take a step back and say, okay, what's really going on here? What's going on here, the mapping we could call the synthesis, and the place and routing we could call the implementation. So we'll see that the Vivado tools provide these two capabilities for us to step in and do an analysis on the intermediate work product at that point in time. For the analysis to take place, there's the need to define the timing constraints. Uh, for us, that will be in the form of the XDC file. Up to this point in time, we've used it to define the I.O. of our design. But now we'll also use it to define the switching characteristics of our design. The first step is to perform the static timing analysis. This the tool does for you. And you'll see when you're working with a project file that I give you that if the constraints that you've established and the content of your design are such that it will not meet timing, the tool will tell you immediately, hey, you have a problem with synthesis, you have a problem with this not being able, this time not being able to met. Then what we're going to do, we're going to see after we've synthesized and again after we've done our implementation, the place and routing, we will run a timing analysis simulation. The Vivado flow is very similar, it just gives a little bit of a different perspective. It shows now the starting point may be your RTL design, which is what we're doing. There's also the capability to have C models that are brought in. You can have 
DSP generators. This is where model sim comes into play. You may also also include your own IP that you've acquired some way, shape, or form. Integrated it into your design. Then what will happen is that design, once you've verified the design by simulating the design, you then want to proceed to implementation. The first being the synthesis, the second being the implementation, and the last step would be once you've programmed the FPGA to debug and make sure that it works properly. So we'll see how at the behavioral level when we're verifying the RTL, at the synthesis level, and then at the implementation level, we're able to run simulations to verify our design. So a top-down methodology is recommended where we try and set up our constraints and then do our design and then compare our results to our expectations. <clears throat> when performing static timing analysis or timing analysis, you might say, on a digital circuit, there's a handful of paths that need to be considered. When I say paths, these are paths inside of our design. The four are itemized here. The first we call clock to setup. Really, it's easier to visualize this path as flock to flop. It's the Q of a flop to the D of the next flop. There'll be a clock to pad. This is from flop to output of your design. From pad to pad, we'll see this is input to output. This would be if you have a path through your design where you have no sequential logic, no flops. It's strictly combination logic passing from pad to pad. And the last is pad to setup, easier to visualize as input to flop. <clears throat> With a timing analysis, the steps we're going to see, we're going to analyze our input timing, our output timing, our flop to flop timing. We'll look at any uh, timing exceptions, and then if we have time, to do our unconstrained paths. So walking through the four types, let's just take a view and see exactly what they are. Clock to setup is referring to the flop to flop path. This is our standard circuit within our design. It's the lion's share of every, all the work that the timing analysis tool has to confirm. The path is from the active edge of the first flop, which generates the clock to Q, which will be the period of time it takes for the clock to register on the output of the flop. Then you have the combinational delay, which is designated by a cloud. So the signal then has to pass through the combinational logic. Then at the receiving flop, it has to meet the setup time. So when we perform this flop-to-flop -flop analysis, what we have to consider is the period of the clock that establishes the budget. The consumers are the clock to queue, the combinational logic and the routing delays that are encountered, and the setup time. The goal is that this period right here would have some margin and we would refer to it as a positive margin. That means that we will meet our flop to flop timing. In the event our combinational logic array is too big, what will happen is this will then encroach on the setup and hold time. Now we have a problem. Now we will not be able to meet our timing. And we'll see examples of that in our exercise. Clock to pad is a flop to output. And there is a certain amount of delay that it will encounter inside of the FPGA. There's a certain amount of delay it will encounter outside. <clears throat> the purpose of the tool is to try and let you know whether or not the signal that you're sourcing with your clock is going to arrive at its destination on time. 
and the tool will try and meet it, but we'll see that we'll define the amount of delay that it will encounter outside of the chip. Then he'll do the analysis to decide, okay, will you be able to meet your output timing? Input to output, this is the path I spoke about where there's a pad, combinational logic pad, and just for the record, pad here refers to an input or an output of the FPGA. And here there's the delay on the input, the delay on the output, and then the delay through the device. We do not have any path like this in our example. And then the last is pad to pad. Okay, this is a mistake. This should be pad to flop. So here it's our input delay. Again, we want to make sure that we're passing through the logic, meeting our setup time at the destination flop. If there's any external delay, we want to make sure that we have a margin. So the first thing we need to do is to, to find the clock. It, the XDC file that we use to establish our I.O., all along we've been defining a clock. And we can see where that's done. That's done below here, lines 7 and 8. <clears throat> in this example, the design that I'm going to introduce in a moment, we'll see that the combo cloud is too large to work with a 10 nanosecond clock period. So initially, we start off telling the tools that our clock period is 15 nanoseconds. And we tell it it has a transition exactly in the middle, which means it's a 50-50 duty cycle on the clock. So again, this will be a number you play with when you're trying to do the exercise at the end of this presentation. So the example we want to use is I want to create a design that will stress the timing. And the design we're considering, as I just stated, doesn't meet a 10 nanosecond clock delay. It will meet a 15 nanoseconds. But because of that discrepancy, we'll be able to see because our simulation will be running at a 10 nanosecond. And then we can see what happens. And then lastly, you will adjust the clock definition to try and determine what is the optimal speed this circuit should run at. Here is the example circuit that we're using for our little exercise. It is a design that matches the template here. It has a register on the inputs. It has a register on the outputs. In between, what it has is a large combinational array. This combinational array, just by chance, is comprised of a barrel shifter instantiated twice. So we bring in the data. We then are able to rotate barrel shifter A, rotate barrel shifter B. We will take the results of those shifts. We'll add them together here. We'll also take the outputs of these two barrel shifters and multiply them together. Then we take the sum and the product, we add it together again to present it to the D of the destination flop. So what we're going to see is it's the period that establishes how much time we have to perform our work. For our initial analysis, we're using a 15 nanosecond period because this combinational cloud is too big. Once you begin to shorten that, you'll see the tool begins to tell you, uh-uh, your design will not work at this speed because you're doing too much. But again, the whole goal of this exercise is to stress the timing of the circuit to allow us to go through the different scenarios. For our input timing constraints, we mentioned them earlier, it's the period of time you're defining that will be utilized external to your device that the path has to path, pass through. So we establish our input delays relative to our system clock, 
and we give it a delay to allow them to establish a timing performance. So I've specified all of the inputs, their delays. I've specified the output delay as well. And for the reset, we've defined it as a false path. We want to tell them, don't perform any timing analysis on reset. The output delay we saw previously, again, it's relative to the system clock. Sys clock pin comes from the definition. So we declare our signal is named clock, but we associate it with sys clock pin for our timing analysis. What I've done is I've taken this combinational design of this design with a large combinational array. I've created a test fixture. <clears throat> the test fixture clocks the design. On the first clock, the input register is captured. Those signals then pass through the large combinational array to arrive at the destination. On the next clock, we capture the results. So the test bench itself uses a random function to generate these inputs, but takes that random function, does its own operation in order to determine the expected results, <clears throat> and then the test bench itself will compare the expected results to allow you to know whether or not the simulation is functioning properly. What I did is after the clock edge that samples this, I wait eight time units before I look. And we'll see exactly how that comes into play and where we're able to break the simulation. Now I want to walk through the different capabilities that Vivado provides us to perform simulation. The first is what we've been using all along. It is run behavioral simulation. So the path shown here is from the flow navigator, the left-hand side of the Vivado window, through simulation, run simulation. There's five options, the first of which we're performing now is run behavioral simulation. So running the simulation at the behavioral simulation level only verifies the proper logical functionality of the design. There are no switching delays because all of the models are ideal. That means there's no delta T to the flops or the gates. For RTL designs or behavioral designs, you could say, there is a heartbeat. There is what keeps the system running. That is the system clock. So in our RTL designs, when we come to verification, the only thing implementation and verification we're concerned about is what happens from clock to clock. When we run the simulation, we see that the outputs switch immediately at the active edge of the clock. When we run, the simulation says, oh, I'm doing fine. Everything I see is exactly what I expect it to be. So this is the type of simulation we've been running all along. It's the behavioral simulation. When you look at running your simulations, you'll see that if you have synthesized and implemented your design, the Vivado tool will create three directories under your sim directory. There is the behavioral, the synthesized, and the implemented netlists. So this is what we always run. When you dig into the behavioral, there is only a single simulation capability. That is the ideal that we talked about in the previous. Once we get a little bit further on, we'll see synthesis and implementation each have two options. We synthesize the design. When we synthesize the design, it translates the RTL code that you've created into a netlist comprised of library cells from the target technology. 
Vivado creates separate netlists for synthesis and implementation sim simulations. So if we dig down in, here we see the same directory structure we had on the previous page. When you drop in, you'll see two directories under the synthesis, funk and timing. Funk refers to functional, timing, of course, to timing. So in the functional, what it's allowing you to do is simulate the netlist with no considerations of time. I'll show you there's a very simple addition, but not much. It's the timing will run the synthesized netlist with timing, and we'll talk a little bit about that. What I want to show you here is that in the directory, so here for the synthesis functional directory, you'll find a netlist. What's important to note is the port list or the top connectivity of your design is exactly the same as the RTL. Because of that, that allows us to instantiate this nest list with our test fixture that we've designed. So when we want to do this, that's why it's important to only communicate with your design through the top level ports. Don't use any dot A, dot B, dot C to get down inside. If you take a peek at the net list, it looks like this, and it's a little bit obscure. Uh, what you'll find is that it makes no effort to keep the structure of the RTL, but oftentimes you can pick up the names that are common that you can then say, oh, I, I know what this signal does or is. So in this case, there's a lookup table. This is where they're performing their combinational logic, and there is a flop. And here there's the clear and the date of the queue and the enable. So each of these we'll see has an instance name. That will come into play in a little bit. Might as well, since I'm here, to mention this guy. This is called an escaped identifier. And what it's doing is an escaped identifier is an identifier that wants to use characters that are not alpha, numeric, and an underscore. So it begins with a backslash. That means every character following it is a part of the signal name until it encounters a space. So they wanted to utilize the left square bracket, zero, right square bracket as part of the instance name here. When we run the simulation, so flow navigator simulation, now we're choosing to run the post synthesis functional simulation. The simulation here is primarily functional, but there's one simple difference. There is a unit delay inserted in, and basically it's applied to the flops. And the unit in this case is 100 picoseconds. So what that means is, from the active edge of the clock, which is here, until the flop switches, there will be a 100 picosecond delay. This gets us off the same edge, but it does not bring in any real consideration of time. All it's doing is causing the flops to take 100 picoseconds to switch, the combinational logic is still switching ideal, meaning there's no delays in the combinational logic. After post-synthesis funk, we now go to post-synthesis timing. Notice that it looks very similar. The net list looks very similar. Might even be the same. I didn't do a diff. But what's added now is what's called the SDF. The SDF is what is named, it's a standard delay format. And it's a file that the tools use to attribute delays. So here, the delays are being attributed to the instances that you see on the right. And what it's telling is the various paths through the design. I'm not going to break it down right now. Uh, 
I can tell you the first parentheses, that's the rise time. The second set of parentheses, that's the fall time. Then the numbers separated by colons are called triplets. It's the min, tip, max. So in this design, there really is no typical. They just have the min and the max, and they replicate the max for the typical. So there's the switching characteristics of the combinational block. Here are the switching characteristics of the flop. And notice that they have constraints that they've built in. They'll check to make sure that you meet your setup and hold on the data and the clear. So we've talked about for our AISO block that there's the need to meet the timing when you release reset. This is where the tools begin to check to make sure that you've met it. So this is post-synthesis. Notice, this time there are delays on both the combinational and the sequ sequential elements. Where did these delays come from? These delays are generated when the library is created. There is a means to estimate what will be the intrinsic delay of each device. And that's what we find in the post-synthesis timing simulation SDF file. When the simulation is run, what happens is the values in the SDF file are copied into the structure of the netlist and then we see the behavior according to the delays that we've added. Now when we look at the simulation, now there are intrinsic delays that are affecting the performance of the design from both the combinational and sequential logic. Now it's no longer ideal, but what's happening is now the results are being pushed to the right for the data out. And as we look, we can see, oh, now that we have a little bit of an approximation of the delays that our device will see, our simulation no longer works. Now the simulation is reporting errors. So that's okay. It's what we expected. It's what I expected in this example. But now... You can see the difference with the simulation of the synthesized functional, we had no errors reported. Synthesized timing, we begin to get errors. When you see this at that level, that's letting you know, hey, you're in trouble because they have not done a detailed review of the paths in the chip, which will just add more delay. So the fact that it fails post-synthesis timing is not good. So the netlist here is comprised of the library cells from the target library. It's accompanied by an SDF file, the standard delay format, that adds delays. The delays account for the switching characteristics of the library, but yet have to include any consideration of the physical implementation. We'll see that even here with the simple addition of the intrinsic delays of the library that we no longer meet our timing. Now we can do post implementation. So this is after we have placed and routed the design. The design is ready to be programmed onto our FPGA. The tools have been able to go in then and get an accurate estimation of not only the intrinsic delays of the devices, but also the delays interconnecting them within the FPGA. But the first simulation we run is post-implementation functional. Again, that's a mistake here, sorry. So the post-implementation functional simulation, again, we just have the 100 picosecond delays. Our results are the same as the post-synthesis. There's no error. So I, since I can edit this, uh, post-implementation function. 
motion simulation. Okay, let me go back. Okay, those are my two mistakes. So thank you for letting me fix them. Let's come down. So we are on the post implementation functional. The results are the same as the post synthesis functional. It passes. Now we want to look at the post implementation timing simulations. So the difference is now the timing estimates include the delays that the device is anticipating will be encountered as the signals move between devices inside of the FPGA. So there needs to be a very accurate timing engine that will provide these times. They document it in the SDF. So again, we run our simulation. We can see that we get a different result. The simulation now will tell you that we failed. That's my reporting inside my test bench. The simulation also trips the violations in the models and they are able to say, hey, at this time you violated your setup and hold constraints at this particular interval. I chopped it off because so it would fit. So again, the goal is, I'm showing you failed scenarios, but the goal is that when you run your post implementation timing, you have enough margin in order to successfully implement your design that it will not pass any, have any failures in the simulations. Okay, so let's take a pause here. So now I'd like to talk about what are we going to do with this information. So I have uploaded this presentation and I will re-upload it with my corrections that I've just made to Dropbox for you to be able to walk through. And I want you to begin to play and I've also uploaded the design itself. The dot v of the design the dot v of the test fixture and two xdf file xdc files for you to be able to recreate the examples that i've just walked you through uh, the architecture of the design is fixed the design is one clock to propagate from input to output the clock period of the test fixture was chosen to identify the fact that the design would be unable to meet timing and the synthesis process would also reveal weaknesses that we can't get it all done in 10 nanoseconds. So I changed the clock to 15 to allow me to create it. Now, what I'd like you guys to do over the next couple weeks is play with the design that I've given you. Play with the Vivado tools. Find what period of the test fixture clock would allow the design to pass all of the functional and both simulation, synthesis timing, and implementation timing sims. Then find out the fastest clock definition in the XDC file that would allow successful synthesis and implementation. So right now we have an implementation, but the first is to play with the delay of the clock in the test fixture to see, okay, at what speed do I generate errors as opposed to what speed do I not generate errors. Then we want to go in, that would be us brute forcing in our test bench trying to find the proper frequency. Then what we want to do, we want to go in and run the tools by adjusting the delay in the XDC file 
to find out what is the fastest clock we could define that would allow it to successfully pass through the synthesis and implementation process. Then what I'd like you to do is write a report to document your findings and have it delivered on the last day of class. So I hope this is helpful. I hope this is a good presentation that we can uh, spend a couple weeks with hands on the Vivado tool providing the timing analysis of an FPGA design. Thank you.